Um, Stephen Friend is a polymath, the consummate polymath. He is a philosopher, a scientist, a poet, a doctor, the CEO of Sage Bio Networks, and a remarkable human. And I'm very pleased to introduce Stephen Friend in his talk, The True Crowdsourcing of Medicine Activating All of Us. Thanks very much. Dreams are contagious. Dreams are contagious. I have a dream that citizens um, will come together, patients and scientists, and together build a knowledge expert that will allow us to be able to treat patients, allow us to have insights into disease that in the past have not been possible to do. Three events are important in making me who I am. The first occurred when I was 13, when my twin brother died in a bicycle accident. The second was spending six years being a pediatric oncologist and watching how the pain and suffering in mediacy of the children actually created heroes, created strength. And thirdly, an event that was a near-death experience where I got to pull back and look over my life and see how we narrowly look at what really goes on in our lives and how the power of being able to see more in terms of understanding why things are the way they are. We are about to exit a very long phase of medicine which was based on symptoms. You had a disease, it was defined by the symptoms. We're about to enter a world where molecular mechanisms identify what people have and provide opportunities for therapies that we're not going to be able to appreciate any more than looking at London in the 1500s has anything to look like the city that's going to host the Olympics next year. Why this is happening is that we are developing, not ourselves in this room, but all around us, shock and awe technologies that will allow us to have our sequences in hours and to have pictures of what goes on within our cells that is m occurring in a way that actually we are becoming the best model organism. By looking at the variations that are happening in each of us, we're beginning to go, oh my God, look what's happening. And in fact, as we go and look at what is occurring, what's really happening in the cell, all these components in the cell start connecting with each other, similar to what the last speaker talked about, and those connections begin to become circuits, and we're beginning to understand it at an incredible level how it is that those conversations become ways of getting actions out of parts of cells, out of those parts of cells into other cells, and into organs, and all of a sudden, there's a, there's a mechanism that allows us to go in and go, ooh, that's not happening the right way. In that cell, instead of going this way, maybe it's gone off some other way. And this is a beautiful uh, picture that, in fact, uh, shows the, the benefit of, of where things are going. And when we look at this in detail, we wake up to something that's really strange. Our brains are wired for the narrative. Our primitive brains are wired to tell stories. We like to think that this goes to this, goes to this, goes to that. But the picture that's occurring is actually what really goes on is an incredibly complex circuitry above that, and that's where we're going to need to look. Those are the maps of disease that we're going to have to build. In order to do that, it's going to be important for us to move away from thinking that someone who has depression or diabetes or cancer is just like every other patient. We're beginning to realize that almost every individual has a little different version of that, and we're going to have to find those relationships, find those maps. Now here comes the hardest thing I'm going to say uh, today, which is we 
are not going to make it in the time that we could. We're not going to be able to do that because we're not prepared to behave and act and treat each other in ways that we're going to have to if we're going to get to there. So what do I mean by that? We've become spectators. In this information age, we've become voyeurs. We're much happier opting out, listening to others, not acting, not doing ourselves. We've got to bring that back and start being greater participants, each of us. Secondly, our hallowed academic institutions have become factories for people who are trying to keep their own employment, they're getting their tenure, and in fact, the whole reward structures keep people from sharing the data that makes those connections, that has those conversations. Similarly, in industry, in biotech, the needs of the biotech uh, VCs to get in three to five years their return on investment prevents people from actually sometimes doing things they should. For example, imagine you have a, tr a failed trial. It would be a good idea to share that information as far as patients. Sometimes that data doesn't get shared. Similarly, our big pharmaceutical companies occasionally get more interested in their quarterly profits than in going, how could we work together? How could we actually make it so that patients could uh, have those uh, benefits? And so we're left in a situation where I think the opportunities are similar to what was recognized 50 years ago by Dwight Eisenhower, World War II veteran, when he recognized that sometimes there are circuits of rewards that are actually helping members of that community that are not helping others. He coined this concept called the Iron Triangle, where the Congress and the military and those who were looking for funds were all basically helping each other. They were supporting each other. They weren't necessarily improving the safety of the country, but they were making good money, and they were making uh, you know, sort of a, a way to stay satisfied. And I will argue that the same iron triangle exists within the medical world, where physicians, academicians, and pharmaceutical companies have great benefits, but the patients are not sitting at the center of that, not sitting where they need to. And in fact, you could say that in fact, there's a medical industrial complex that needs to be taken down in order to progress. So why this is so sad is we're sitting at this spectacular time in history when actually we now know this data is coming forward, this ability to connect and actually have real insights is about to occur. But guess what? Most people don't really want to share. They want to keep their own little special part for their special reward structures. And so we have to change our behavior if we're going to have that benefit uh, occur earlier. Two quick experiments. The first is a project being done at Sage Bionetworks, the nonprofit foundation. And it's saying, what would happen if we borrowed from software engineers the concept of working together on a big problem, not trying to get a reward, not getting a first author named paper, but actually trying to really solve a problem in a virtual space where those ideas that happen around the coffee cooler or other places are able to be pulled together and, and, and brought forward. Why don't we borrow for them from them the concept of open access data being shared, since it's the patients, not actually those that are uh, uh, developing it. And secondly, a project that has been an important one is one that has to do with taking five groups, all competing heavily with each other, and saying to them, hey, let's pull those five groups at Stanford, at, at other uh, universities, let's pull them together and let's share all the data all the models, all the tools. That's a real experiment that's just gotten started that gives the ability to actually look at disease processes. So in my next to the last slide, I want you to think of yourselves of the power that comes from taking citizens, patients, and um, scientists, and remembering that each of you should be considered a citizen, scientist, and patient. And whether it's Eric Schott or Peter Capitan or Sharon Terry, these are individuals who are living those multiple roles, participating. And so I leave you with one question. Who will build the disease models soon capable of providing powerful insights to cure patients? And the answer is you. If you aren't, it won't happen. Thanks.